We're going to try to nourish both your mind and your body over this lunch. So we are going to have a panel during lunch. Please feel free to continue to eat. I just ask you to save some dessert for the rest of us here on the dais, if you don't mind. <laughs> so my name is Chris Calabia, and I'm from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And so pleased to welcome you to this luncheon uh, to talk about central banks and innovation. And I'm very happy that we have two experts on this subject here to join me today for this discussion on the dais. Allow me to introduce first Deputy Governor Aisha Ahmad, the Financial Stability Section at the Central Bank of Nigeria, sitting to my immediate left. The Deputy Governor is a member of the Monetary Policy Committee, as well as the Committee of Governors at the Central Bank there. And her primary responsibility is for financial policy, as well as the regulation of the banking and the payment systems. Uh, she chairs the National Payment Switch, as well as the Financial Inclusion Techn Technical Committee. And if you were here yesterday for Mary Ellen Iskandarian's keynote speech, you saw d d the Deputy Governor in a video in her prior life in the private sector when she was an executive director at Diamond Bank, one of Nigeria's largest banks, and one of the banks that worked with World's, Women's World Banking on the Beta Savings Project, uh, Savings Product. And the Deputy Governor has over 20 years of private sector experience in financial services. So welcome, Deputy Governor, to Ann Arbor. Sitting to the, uh, my left, your right, is Leonardo Gambacorta, who is the head of innovation and the digital economy unit at the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland. If you're not familiar with the BIS, the BIS is a bit like a central bank for central banks, in a way. Uh, he is an economist by training, and Leonardo serves as the head of monetary served as head of monetary policy at the BIS, and, as well as the head of money and credit union uh, credit unit and the head of the banking sector unit in the research section at the Bank of Italy in Rome. And his primary research interests include monetary transmission mechanisms, effectiveness of macroprudential policies on systemic risk, and the effects of technological innovation on financial intermediation, which is his main area of focus currently in his, in his new role at the BIS. And I'm Chris Calabia from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as I mentioned. And at the Gates Foundation, we believe that every person deserves the chance to lead a healthy and productive life. And so you're probably very familiar with the Gates Foundation's work in health, medicines, vaccinations, and education, and so on. But we also have a focus on financial inclusion because a good body of research suggests that when people who are unbanked or poor and marginalized groups and women, when they have access to accounts, and especially digital financial services accounts, they are better able to lift themselves out of poverty by improving their ability to save, to borrow, and to make payments and to invest in their futures. And so that's why we care about financial inclusion and I'm very happy to partner with the University of Michigan on this important project. I'm also a recovering regulator and central banker myself, I have to say. I worked for 25 years for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in the supervision section there, and also spent two years at the BIS as well, working for the standard setting body for bank supervisors called the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. And so I should stress that any comments or opinions that I may share today are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of the Gates Foundation or, frankly, anyone else who matters. <laughs> so I'd really like to thank Michael Barr, Adrian Harris, uh, Chrissy Baer, Kelly Brown, Tracy Van Dusen, Ashton, uh, Ashton Smith, as well as the large number of RAs and staff here at the university, Sam, Jesse, Sean, Jay, Jennifer, Lucas, Cole, and Nick for putting on such a wonderful conference. I hope you might join me in a round of applause for them to thank them for all their hard work to make this come together. So we're going to talk today about in uh, innovation, and in particular the role that central banks have in responding to that innovation in the marketplace. And Leonardo, at the BIS, you and your colleagues are, have been monitoring and reporting on the emergence of some disruptive technologies in the marketplace and some new service providers in the financial services spaces. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how these new players have expanded into the provision of financial, service, uh, financial services. And I know that you have some slides you'd like to share with us on this question. Yes, I have. Yeah. First of all, thank you, uh, Chris. Thanks to all the organizers for uh, inviting me to this uh, panel. It's a great ple pleasure and honor. Um, I have prepared some slides uh, to uh, introduce uh, uh, the topic of uh, big tech in, uh, in finance. And these slides uh, are, uh, are based on some research that uh, we have conducted at the BIS. And uh, they are summarized in, uh, in a chapter of our uh, annual uh, economic uh, report. Uh, obviously, the usual uh, disclaimer applies. So. Um, we know that uh, uh, technology firms uh, 
uh, we have in mind uh, Alibaba, Amazon, Google, uh, Facebook, Tencent, the ones that are on uh, the left side of uh, our, uh, on this, uh, of this slide, uh, so-called big techs uh, have uh, uh, grown rapidly in the last uh, decade, and uh, they have started to do some uh, inroads into, into finance. So uh, these, uh, uh, these firms are, are very big. This is the name, big tech. And indeed, uh, they have uh, a level of uh, market capitalization that is higher than uh, uh, those of the GCBs, the, uh, the ones that are the, the biggest financial institution in, in, in the world. Um, so why uh, technology firms venture into finance? They basically, they have uh, the so-called uh, DNA, so it's a data uh, network externalities and activities uh, that is a sort of a feedback loop that allow them uh, to have uh, uh, a lot of uh, synergies. Uh, you can think about uh, a payment firm having a lot of data, creating network externalities, developing in the platform new activities, and these activities will bring new data. So it's sort of a reinforcing uh, loop. Indeed, uh, the first fact that I want to mention to you is that uh, big tech uh, have uh, a portion of uh, their revenues uh, that uh, uh, derive from financial services. But at the moment, uh, this uh, uh, part that you can see in, uh, on uh, uh, the left uh, side of this uh, slide is still uh, uh, relatively small. Is, uh, it, uh, it is something like 11% 11, 11 of uh, the total uh, revenues while uh, uh, their core business is still uh, in uh, uh, information technology and consulting, so cloud computing, uh, uh, data analytics, uh, that represent around 46% uh, of, of total uh, revenues. We know that uh, big techs, they serve globally, but uh, when uh, we look uh, at, the, uh, at the big tech subsidiaries that is on the right hand side of this uh, slide, uh, we can see that uh, their operations are mainly located in uh, North America and in uh, Asia uh, Pacific, but uh, uh, they have moved uh, quite extensively in, in China, as we know, with uh, Tencent and uh, Ant Financial. Uh, but still, they are developing also expanding rapidly in emerging market economies uh, in areas uh, uh, that are Southeast Asia, East Africa, and Latin America. So the second fact is uh, that uh, uh, the, the development of, uh, uh, of big tech financial services uh, uh, follows uh, a very precise uh, pattern. So uh, for example, payment services were the first financial services that uh, big tech uh, offered. And the example we have in mind uh, are uh, typically uh, uh, Alipay uh, of the group uh, uh, Alibaba and uh, PayPal for, for eBay. And uh, these are, uh, uh, financial services that are fully integrated into the e-commerce uh, platform. The, uh, the development of uh, uh, big tech uh, payment service is, uh, uh, is higher in uh, those countries that uh, had uh, less financial develop, uh, credit card uh, payment. And indeed, uh, uh, they benefit from the fact that in, uh, in, uh, in a lot of uh, countries, there is a, a, a high fraction of the population that uh, use mobile phone. So this could explain, for example, why uh, China has uh, an outstanding uh, level of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, b a big tech payment over GDP, it's a 16%, with respect to very low level in the United States, India, Brazil, Indonesia, and United Kingdom, for the combination of these uh, two factors. Um, so as a sort of a, a, a prolongation of, of the story, so after payment uh, service, Big Tech started to offer uh, via their, their uh, application uh, also other products. And uh, these are typically uh, well management products and uh, uh, such as uh, money market funds. So in these slides, I, I just uh, represent uh, uh, um, one, uh, um, the composition of uh, one very important uh, money market fund, because it's uh, the biggest in the, in the world, is uh, the UBAO uh, uh, that is offered by the Alipay Group. And uh, I want to show some interesting facts. Uh, on the, on the uh, left-hand side, you can see that uh, the composition of uh, the asset of UBAO uh, are mainly in uh, bank deposits. So 60% of the asset of UBAO are in bank deposits. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, the maturity of uh, UBAO asset uh, on the right hand side, you can see that uh, 
uh, around half of the asset have a maturity of less than 30 days. So what does it mean this? Is, uh, first of all, uh, is that uh, there is a, relation, a relationship between, between the big tech and, and banks that is, quite, that is quite complex. And then this also reflects also potential financial stability concern because uh, imagine a run on, uh, on the money market fund that is composed of uh, uh, bank deposit short term. This obviously will create some difficulties also for bank funding. So the, uh, the last fact I, I want to, sh uh, to show you is that uh, big tech credit uh, is, uh, is also offered by, uh, by, uh, by uh, these large technology, te technology firms, uh, but uh, it is a small uh, with respect to, uh, uh, to other forms of, uh, of financing. Uh, if you think about uh, the, the new uh, uh, fintech credit uh, uh, in uh, 2017, this uh, represented 0.5% of uh, total outstanding credit uh, in the world. And even in China, China is uh, the vanguard of, uh, for the offering of this product, it's uh, only 3%. Um, some studies conducted at the BAS show that uh, uh, there is a negative correlation between uh, the level of financial development of a country and the level of big tech credit. You can see this uh, from the left-hand side uh, part of this graph, uh, where you have on the horizontal line uh, the fraction of uh, number of uh, the number of branches uh, per adult population, and uh, on the vertical axis uh, you have the ratio, the logarithm of the ratio between big tech credit and total credit. But also there is uh, one final consideration I want to do uh, is uh, that uh, uh, yes, big tech credit is small. Uh, but it's very different. It's very different from uh, bank loans. And uh, you can see this from uh, this uh, uh, right hand side, where uh, with uh, some uh, um, colleagues in China, Yiping Wang and Anq, uh, using uh, unfinancial data, we have tried to uh, understand the correlation of credit with respect to asset price. And we have seen that uh, while uh, uh, traditional uh, bank loans uh, are uh, uh, correlated with asset price, and this is at uh, the basis of in the model what we have in uh, the financial accelerator mechanism, big tech credit is not, is not uh, correlated. It's more correlated with the business cycle. So this changed completely the monetary transmission mechanism and the way uh, uh, central banks should factor in the, uh, uh, the development of, uh, of, uh, of big tech credit. In this uh, final slide, I just uh, report some uh, uh, additional uh, studies that have been conducted at BAS if you want to uh, to develop further some of these points. So Leonardo, that's a fascinating overview, and I, I commend the paper to the audience's uh, reading later. It's a, it's a great paper looking at big tech and these very large firms getting into financial services. Can you tell us a little bit about maybe some of the benefits that they might bring, as well as some of the drawbacks? You mentioned the monetary policy challenge uh, as being maybe one of the drawbacks, but are there additional things that we should think about as regulators and supervisors? So it's a, it's, a very, uh, it's a very interesting question that uh, uh, I will try to develop just uh, uh, making one example that is the one for uh, uh, the, the market for credit. So first of all, uh, uh, the, the benefit and the cost of uh, big tech in finance derive from uh, the DNA. So this uh, data network activity feedback loop creates uh, uh, a lot of potential and benefit in terms of financial inclusion, but also a lot of risk. So let me start with the, the, the potential in uh, having as, as an example the, the credit market. So uh, in terms of provision of credit, uh, there, is, uh, 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 there are benefits coming from uh, uh, the screening activity and uh, uh, the uh, enlargement of the provision of credit to uh, the financially excluded. So there is uh, uh, already literature showing that uh, 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 the use of uh, um, um, machine learning and big data for credit scoring uh, allows uh, to the big tech uh, to uh, uh, serve credit to uh, uh, a lot of segment of, of the population that are financially excluded. And this is clear with experience of uh, uh, and econometric analysis that we have conducted for China and, 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 uh, and uh, Argentina with the Mercado Libre. Uh, other potential benefits are uh, derived from the fact that uh, there is no need for collateral. So what we say is that, uh, in a way, data substitutes uh, uh, collateral. And uh, uh, this is also uh, uh, producing a positive effect in terms of, uh, of financial inclusion. 
But as I mentioned, there are uh, also uh, some potential costs that uh, derive from, uh, from the data, from the use of the data. And these are basically two. First is uh, uh, potential uh, um, effects derived from market power. And the second one is about the misuse of data. So market power, it is clear. So big tech, uh, they can uh, become uh, a dominant player and uh, basically they can consolidate their position by raising uh, barriers to entry or they can simply exclude uh, other firms uh, from uh, the uh, provision of their, or their services uh, in, in their platform. They, they can just uh, simply uh, offer their own, uh, their own products. Uh, and the misuse of data, there are, uh, there are also some uh, uh, studies that show that uh, it could be that uh, uh, as big tech are, are, very, uh, are very smart in price discrimination and in rent extraction, this could be uh, not beneficial for consumer and there is a, a debate in terms of how to reallocate this uh, consumer surplus. And uh, also potential uh, um, uh, negative effect could be uh, derived from the fact that uh, if the algorithm that they use uh, are particularly uh, um, uh, smart and uh, in detecting uh, the risk, uh, some uh, part of the population that are risky, that they should uh, be, for example, insured, that they could be excluded. Or also some form of discrimination in terms of uh, uh, minority. Think about, uh, I don't know, there is a paper that showed that uh, black and Hispanic in the, in the US uh, could uh, be, say, could have less uh, potential benefit than, than the other categories. So at the end, in terms of public policy, I think that uh, big technology firm brings uh, bring uh, uh, a lot of uh, potential benefit, but these has to have to be uh, uh, evaluated in terms of also the cost. So at the end, it's a, it's a public choice, yes. and uh, it's a choice of uh, societies. Societies could have different preferences, also de depending on their different uh, level of uh, uh, financial development. Yes, well, ha having read your paper and heard your remarks today, it, it feels to me like this is maybe just the beginning of the chapter of big techs and finance that, as you said, their credit extensions are rather low. But that said, Facebook has 2.7 billion customers. Gmail has 1.5 billion users. I mean, these are larger than most countries. And so they have a tremendous base to expand to if they choose to do that. And so we'll need to think carefully about those subjects. So thank you very much for that overview, Leonardo. Deputy Governor Ahmad, could you share some of the perspectives, perhaps, as a central banker and supervisor working in a dynamic and vibrant market like Nigeria, which has a very young population, growing quickly. You know, ha what types of products and services and providers are you seeing that are disruptive? And how do you think about those as a central banker and supervisor? OK. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah. OK. So um, I think we're seeing disruption across the value chain of financial services in Nigeria. Um, I know that when people talk about tech, data, innovation, digital innovation, people tend to look at that as disrupting what the traditional banks are doing. But interestingly, in Nigeria, and I'll use Nigeria a lot because that's you know, the jurisdiction that I come from, we find that we see this happening even within traditional banking services where banks are deploying AI-based solutions for convenience of customers, they're using it for their credit scoring, they're using chatbots increasingly. It's sort of in terms of driving product development, product design within the banking sector. And then some of these technologies as well. The fintechs are partnering with the banks and are providing these as value added services for the banking system. Because I think it's really important to situate that there as well, to say that this disruption is not just expanding the number of players, it's also changing what we see within the banking sector. We think that as regulators, we're always looking at how we can bring the cost of financial services down to reduce the cost. And we see technology, innovation, um, new channels of delivery, reducing cash and the cost of cash as a huge opportunity that we can leverage. Having said that, we're seeing disruption in savings, for example. Um, new savings apps that is helping to bring um, beyond typical savings, government savings, people that want to invest in government treasuries can now do it via their mobile phone. In the past, this used to be reserved for the high net worth individuals that have access to large private banks. 
we're seeing happily disruption in the micro lending area where you have some companies providing micro loans to often people that ordinarily would not um, qualify for a loan within a sort of typical bank. But I think one of the, the biggest disruptions we've seen is in the payment system mm -hmm. itself, um, enabling merchants to collect you know, um, payment for goods and services. You talked about Nigeria, about 200 million people youth, so 60% of that is people under the age of 35. A lot of creativity in there, a lot of, um, the informal side is pretty big, but it's also increasingly bringing up these new entrepreneurs that are leapfrogging your typical open a store. It's like I have an idea, I go onto Instagram, I sell, I collect, somebody needs a, to give me a solution for that. And Instagram is across borders, you know, it's Nigeria, it's Kenya, it's Egypt, it's the UK. I have to deliver, I have to collect payment. You come to talk about the arrangements around regional payments and international payments. So we see fintechs entering the merchant acquiring space a lot. Um, we see them providing solutions that I've spoken to. And of course, the opportunity. So in terms of how we see it as regulators, I've said one part of it, we like it because if it brings down the cost of providing services, all well and good. Um, the data helps us to make better decisions, even for the banks. You know, and when we talked about financial health today, um, and if you want central banks to, to, to measure, we're going to need that data. Um, of course, the opportunities where financial inclusion sort of concerned, the results speak for themselves. Today, Nigeria, 63% um, is our financial inclusion number, and a lot of that has happened in the last seven years. We've seen astronomical increases in instant payments, POS use, reduction in check use, you know, e-transactions, um, digital government digitizing their collections, and we've seen all of that. So those are the good benefits. And of course, it's also a huge opportunity for a regulator to expand their um, sort of coverage in terms of the types of organizations you supervise. Sometimes you also talk about that as a problem, but it's actually an opportunity to be able to see more come out of the shadow banking space where you had no visibility to see these new um, companies emerge. The risks, apart from the cyber risks that I think is par for course when it comes to technology, so let's pack that. For a regulator, you're thinking about the fragmentation of the number of you know, organizations. They have, some of them are banks, some of them are not banks, some of them are tech companies. There was an earlier conversation about what regulators should be doing to collaborate. Should the telco regulator be collaborating, for instance, with the banking regulator? Um, so there's that fragmentation. You have to consider borders, you know, um, if you're serving Nigerian customers, but you're not registered in Nigeria, how do I sort of ensure that consumers are protected, their data is protected? So new questions about cross-border collaboration, sort of in that respect. Proportionality, over-regulation, under-regulation. If you talk to a typical bank, they'll tell you that the fintechs are not regulated properly. They feel over-regulated and they think you're giving these guys a free pass. Should you use the same risk-based regulatory supervisory framework for these companies or should you come up with something different? So for us, these are questions that we need to answer as the market evolves. I love the earlier conversation about control versus innovation and those trade-offs and I think we'll, there's no simple answer, we will, we will keep having to make those trade-offs as um, it works for the jurisdiction. What I would favor is a nuanced approach, an inclusive approach, and I think that the, the fact that many central banks and emerging markets are doing sandboxes should give us comfort that they're willing to give these companies sort of a playing ground where we can just observe in an environment of trust, because they also have to believe that if they come out, so to speak, you won't be using the knowledge you have of the operations to, um, should I say, make it difficult for them to innovate. I think one other thing I didn't mention is that usually when it comes to innovation, the companies are young, mm. they're creative, 
an operational risk is not exactly what's on their mind when they start. <laughs> or anti money laundering or other things. Yes, or AML CFT. Yes. <laughs> um, that is what you'd expect of banks. And banks have frankly come a long way. Mm. You know, they probably didn't start this way. They've had years and years sort of of that. So from a regulator's perspective, we welcome this for all of the good things it can do for us on financial inclusion, reducing the cost, improving access, all the problems around ID, you know, and all those barriers or address verification. If technology can do this for us, yes, but then we need to then balance with all of these other considerations. Yes, well, well thank you for that wonderful overview of the various trends taking place in Nigeria, but you're also reflecting on some trends that, although you mentioned they are, these are largely your experience, there are yes. experiences in other countries as well. And in particular, I wanted to call at one point that you mentioned, and that is the, the cost savings that technology is driving. Yes. Saving money on these transactions is not just an efficiency thing. It actually is a powerful driver for inclusion. Because if you look at the legacy banking model, you know, bricks and mortar branches and agencies and so on, it's very expensive to build a brick and mortar ba banking network. Yes. Uh, but we have found, and, and some of the research we've sponsored has found, that when you move to digital financial services, you can cut costs by 90%. And that means suddenly you can serve a much larger population than you could serve before. It's much more profitable to serve people who live in rural areas and remote areas where you would never go and provide a branch. But I wanted to pick up on your, your point about innovation and the new kinds of companies coming into the space yes. and, and also the impact that they're having on the legacy companies. So Nigeria has a very interesting new banking license that's been yes. introduced. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about this payment service bank and okay. what drove that decision. Yes. Well, it's not new, I have to say, because there's a lot of excitement because I think we've been waiting for Nigeria to make it to decide how it's going to go, where sort of this big idea about bringing in new players, mm -hmm. you know, and what it does for, you know, expanding inclusion. So the Payment Service Bank is our way of bringing in more participants. Everybody focuses on the telcos because it allows the telcos in, but it's actually beyond the telcos. It's looking at anyone that has a channel that can be leveraged to um, create more access. So it's the supermarkets, it's the retailer, the big retailers, um, it's the mobile money companies, which in Nigeria usually have spent the last, since we licensed them about 10 years ago, building these agent networks. So it's anyone that has a network that can be leveraged to get more people access. When we're talking about costs, one thing I forgot to mention was that increasingly we see banks, um, instead of expanding their ATM sort of structure, what they're doing is expanding POS using agents because it's mm -hmm. cheaper and the technology is nimble. It's easier to sort of maneuver and deliver the service. So the thinking behind the PSB, even though you have about 63% um, inclusion, our target is 80% by next year. You still have a huge, because of the huge population, you still have huge opportunities in the excluded. And what we're trying to do is to get more people access. Now, we've been licensing all sorts of institutions. We have microfinance banks, for instance, as well. We have switching companies. We have payment terminal solution providers. We have all of these sort of regulations that have enabled new players come in. But one thing we have found is that the pattern of provision still usually revolves around the urban areas. It's usually concentrated in certain areas. So one of the problems we're trying to solve with the PSB license, because if you look at the way the guidelines have been put, it's supposed to be technology driven, it's supposed to bring in more participants, it's supposed to be um, focused on 50% of, so if they're going to build any physical structures, we want that 50% of that should be in rural areas, mm -hmm underbanked areas, underserved areas. So it's, it's specifically focusing on this exclusion problem in terms of access. And to track and to monitor um, how well we're doing, we're just completing our financial access maps, that it's going to be an interactive map um, that will show, you know, broadly speaking, what the opportunities are in terms of financial access, where we have our banks, where we have ATMs, where we have agents, where we have PSBs, where we have, and you know, another thing about the PSBs that I think is critical for us to know is that the telcos come with this established agent network that they've been using to deploy value-added services. Now, these are potential points we can use to expand our ID system, for instance. When we have the ID system, we came up with the um, bank verification number a few years ago. We have 40 million Nigerians on that. And we're looking to expand that across the population. Now, imagine if you had 200,000, 300,000 more points where people can go and sort of register and all that. It totally opens up the opportunities for those that are excluded. Um, we looked at the India model, payment bank model. Where one of the things we liked about that was 
the fact that you know the payment banks in India are focused only on deposit mobilization, mm -hmm. at least for now. I think they have a 25% sort of focus on the rural areas. We have a 50. Um, some of the additional things we put in, apart from increasing the sort of um, minimums yes. we want in terms of rural areas, is that we thought it was also important what you were talking about, Leonardo, about market power and the, um, the fact that if you have, um, if a payment service bank has um, a parent that controls some services across the chain, you want to ensure that it is providing the same level of service across the entire participants in the market. The last thing you want is for some participants to get sort of better pricing or yes. better service and you know so I, and the the guidelines sort of try to sort of address Create level all of that yeah. it's still early days we've just given um approvals in principle yes. but we're very excited about the potential given what we already know about the the, the channels you know yes. that these organizations bring and the variety that these organizations bring Yes, well, thank you for the very detailed view into Nigeria and what's going on there. Yeah. Leonardo, perhaps you could help us look at the global perspective and think a little bit about some of the public policy challenges that we're facing now as regulators, and how is the BIS thinking about some of these issues at a global level? Well, uh, we, uh, we consider them, uh, um, we consider financial, in, financial innovation uh, at, the, at, the, at the center of our uh, medium-term strategy. So uh, indeed, uh, there is uh, uh, the BAS 2025 innovation strategy that really reflects uh, so a commitment of, of the BAS to uh, uh, embrace uh, uh, continuous innovation to prepare uh, the BAS itself uh, for the, the change of, of, of tomorrow. So we, uh, we, uh, we are doing this in two, uh, in two fronts. One is uh, to be... Uh, innovative in what we provide for uh, the central bank community. And uh, mm. an example is as, uh, to support uh, central banks that are doing uh, uh, very good things as uh, uh, in the case of uh, the central bank of Nigeria. The other is uh, to uh, uh, innovate uh, uh, ourselves in terms of how we operate as an institution. Mm. So, so we see uh, this uh, as inter internally as, uh, as a big change. Indeed, the one element of, uh, of our strategy is uh, the creation of uh, the BAS uh, 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 innovation Hub, and this uh, will have uh, uh, three main goals. So the first one uh, is uh, uh, to identify uh, uh, and develop uh, uh, in, uh, um, in uh, uh, critical trends in financial technology that are uh, of relevance of central banks. The second goal is uh, to uh, develop uh, public goods uh, in the technology space that are geared towards uh, the, uh, the improving of uh, the, financial, uh, the financial system uh, and the global, globally uh, to produce efficiency. And then uh, to serve as a, as a focal point uh, uh, for a network of central bank experts on, on innovation. So uh, as, uh, uh, the, 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 as we know, the IT revolution uh, knows no border. Yes. It will be lo located in different uh, parts of the globe. It will be in multiple locations in Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, and uh, Basel, uh, Zurich. Yes. Um, another initiative is uh, uh, to uh, foster uh, policy-oriented research that uh, could uh, try to uh, uh, answer some of these uh, relevant policy questions, and, uh, um, and indeed the creation of uh, uh, the unit I'm leading, the Innovation and Digital Economy Unit, uh, respond to this, uh, to this need. And uh, we have uh, a number of projects that are uh, currently uh, in uh, development uh, uh, in areas such as, uh, well, one is uh, big tech in finance and the impact in terms of uh, competition. The second one is uh, uh, tokenization of assets, uh, uh, central bank digital currency, global stable coin, mm -hmm. how this will impact uh, in, uh, in the future of the monetary system. The third area is, uh, uh, more in general, how financial innovation could uh, impact uh, uh, on uh, the macroeconomy and the conduct of, uh, of monetary policy. And the last one uh, is a uh, point that uh, it was also mentioned this morning uh, many times uh, into the, the panel, uh, is uh, uh, the role of uh, RegTech, uh, uh, SubTech, and uh, GovTech. And in particular, one example is how to study the, the, the firms that uh, take part to a sandbox uh, if they 
this impact in their exposed uh, performance. These are just, uh, in a nutshell, a few elements of our strategy for the medium term to, to uh, analyze uh, how financial innovation and technology could impact on, uh, on the work of central banks. So, so that's really exciting and, and fascinating to see that the BIS, uh, which I think traditionally is viewed as a very conservative organization, mm -hmm. is actually pushing forward with ideas about innovation and trying to rethink things. And when I've heard Governor, uh, Mr. Carstens, the, the general manager of the BIS, uh, talk about these things in the past, he emphasized two things. He men mentioned the, the soft public goods, which the BIS has long done in terms of standard setting and so on. But he also talked about hard public goods. And, and do you have an idea what, what he means by that? Is he talking about actually software and, and that sort of thing? No, no. The, the hard infrastructure are, are actually uh, those uh, examples that uh, uh, Aisha was mentioning. So we need uh, to uh, uh, not to forget the fact that uh, central banks uh, create uh, trust yes. in the payment system and uh, a solid uh, public infrastructure is, uh, is very important. This morning there was also discussion in the panel about the experience of uh, uh, India with the digital ID and uh, uh, the payment infrastructure they have uh, created. So uh, in a way, uh, the goal of uh, uh, central banks is uh, to reinforce uh, these, uh, these, uh, these aspects in order to create a very solid uh, environment for the financial uh, system in, in the future. Yes, thank you. So uh, Deputy Governor Ahmad, I was wondering if you could respond to that. Do central banks have a role to play in promoting innovation themselves? The short answer is yes. Yeah. Um, the long answer is where does it stop? Where does it start? Where does it stop? You know. So the legal framework needs to be in there. The regulation and the policy, they should do that. They should provide some of the utilities. Well, that's my view. I know there's sort of two camps in that respect because we heard this morning about what are some of the potential pitfalls mm. if they provide utilities and sort of the power to sort of take them away. Um, we should be at the forefront of innovation because of all the reasons that we've mentioned and all the benefits. We've talked about the fact that inclusion is quasi into the mandate. So if it's going to help you achieve the mandate, and even if it wasn't in, inside the mandate, the truth is that it does help you foster the financial and the monetary and the price stability that you need. So we, we, we definitely, as regulators, need to be sort of very interested at that. The, the jury is out as to at what point yes. we, we allow the market to self-regulate. I don't know if that time would ever come where the market can sort of by itself just go here and you know, do this. Um, luckily, we're having this conversation. And when I meet other central bankers, you know, I'm happy to know that we're not the only ones grappling with yes. what these choices sort of should mean. Um, a lot of the emerging market economies have leapfrogged some of the developed ones in terms of embracing technology because of the real issues that needed to be, to be resolved. And um, I think they, these economies will be the test case for how well this sort of is going to work. Thus far, it's worked well for us to provide the infrastructure, for instance, set up a central switch, set up a central depository, you know, make it fit for purpose for everyone to sort of plug in, you know. Um, there could be conversations about a single source of failure, mm. right? So um, when that comes up, you, you come up with other, other solutions. I heard from one of the colleagues yesterday about what DLT can do to, to resolve, um, distributed ledger technology can do to resolve this single point of failure sort of issue. So as we sort of walk down this road, I think that we, as regulators, will always keep our eye on, on the pitfalls and the risks and find ways to um, sort of um, um, combat them. If you look at the Nigeria experience, all of the regulations that we've come up with is what has enabled these companies to thrive. Let's not forget, without the licensing, without the rules, without the guidelines, they won't be even there for us to see yes. today. So you can't take Today, you can't take the central banks out of the conversation about innovation. Yes. I think what needs to happen then is that at what point do we get to where we say, OK, it's time to hand over to yes. this market. What a wonderful way to sum up our conversation, both in, yes. in this session as well as for, the, for most of the conference. Mm -hmm. I think we have time perhaps for one question. Is it one question? <laughs> one, a very short question? Short. Yes. So if you raise your hand, you must promise you can ask this question in one sentence, no run-on sentences. Yes, please. <laughs> Changes from where they started to bank deposits, and now it looks like half of it is repo. What does it do for monetary policy? 
especially since you mentioned that the shadow bank world is actually coming into light. But that slide shows something different. Well, the, the monetary transmission mechanism will be, uh, will be definitely uh, affected by uh, this, uh, uh, this change. Uh, in, uh, in, the, in the last slide, uh, I don't know if you refer to the last slide or, or, or the slide on the money market funds, but in both cases uh, there is an effect on the monetary transmission mechanism because uh, in one case, uh, uh, the case of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the correlation with respect to uh, the, the asset price uh, uh, the, uh, we have in mind in the, the traditional uh, uh, macroeconomic model the financial accelerator. So this means that uh, when, for example, there is a monetary tightening, uh, there is uh, an effect on, uh, on house price uh, that uh, will uh, amplify uh, the, 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 the transmission. In case of uh, uh, big tech credit, uh, these, uh, uh, these effects are... Uh, uh, are, uh, are not in place simply because uh, they, are, they don't rely on collateral. So this means that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the credit will be more correlated with uh, the normal, uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, business cycle. So this could be an implication for uh, the transmission mechanism. And uh, a second aspect uh, is uh, related to the, the, the slide on the money market uh, fund. Um, there, uh, we can see that uh, there is a complex relationship that has to be uh, fully uh, understood because uh, uh, the, um, there is a sort of uh, connection between uh, the big tech and the bank in terms of their assets and, and liabilities. So this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, basically has, uh, has to be uh, uh, analyzed deeply uh, uh, also in, in, uh, in uh, relation with the, the different uh, uh, institutional uh, characteristics. For example, uh, um, the People Bank of China was, uh, was aware of uh, this effect uh, on the float uh, that uh, was uh, uh, in a way um, uh, factored in by the creation of 100% reserve uh, that now uh, big tech companies have to, uh, uh, have to deposit with the, with, the, with the central bank. So this is just an example to, uh, to show you that uh, uh, central banks are, uh, are, are aware, are studying a little bit the, the evolution of uh, the effect of uh, technology. The response is not uh, naive, it has to be really uh, well crafted. And uh, it really depends on institutional, uh, institutional characteristics. So let me again encourage you to read Leonardo's paper on this subject of the big tech in, in finance. So with that, let me just sum this up very quickly by saying that today at the session we've learned that, and we know that innovation can help us to serve the poor and a broader section of the population better. Innovation can change the players in the marketplace, including the legacy players, and central bankers can drive some of that innovation. And here we have two excellent examples of central bankers who are driving innovation at both at the global level and at the national level. So please join me in thanking both Leonardo and Deputy Governor Ahmad for joining us. <laughs>